Yes. this off okay. we do have we're missing our speaker oh, no john is here i'm sorry john is here <laughs> i'm checking my oh, my speakers yeah, yeah. so john is here florence is here Next to Brita. And then oh, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brita, I don't see. I'm sorry? Brita, I don't see. Which is later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the PQ Working Group meeting, uh, this IT of 118. So, thank you for being until Friday here. Um, so just to remind you all, uh, first thing, please sign in using the QR code or in your usual Miteco, because we need that for later knowing how many people actually attended. Um, just to be in mind, we obviously have the note well as generally in the IDF. Um, so if you are participating here, you're also agreeing to the note well and all of the IDF process. Also note really well, if you haven't seen this slide, this is the second note well. <laughs> Um, just to make meeting tips, again, please be sure to sign in using uh, Miteco. And again, this session is recorded and all of the videos are going to be pasted, uh, posted later to YouTube. We already have a note taker, so thank you very much. Um, two up, actually, so thank you. And if you actually want to be part of the queue, remember that you have to use, again, the Miteco and sign up using the raise hand uh, functionality. And then during that time, please uh, unmute yourself. But during all of the times, please keep the video and the audio muted. And of course, we also follow the ITF code of conduct. And with that, so thank you for being here. If you want to know more about the working group, you can read our chart in the data tracker. And we also have a mailing list. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe to that one. We also have a GitHub repository, so you can also watch it. Uh, right now, some status of the working group. You want to do that, Paul? Um, sure. Okay. okay. So for people who aren't familiar with the PQIP working group, which I, I, I see lots of unfamiliar faces, um, this, is, this working group is not meant... Oh, Rowan wants me to speak closer. Thank you. I can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Her, her voice carries much better than mine. Um, this working group is not, in fact, is chartered not to make protocols. So if you're here to watch protocols get made, you're in the wrong place. The general purpose of this working group is to coordinate among other working groups in the IETF about um, post-quantum algorithms that they are using. We also are sort of the uh, home of last resort for uh, algorithms that need, po uh, for protocols that need post-quantum algorithms and don't actually have a, um, uh, a working group anymore. Uh, we aren't really working on that now. But in addition, we get to have other drafts. So what you see on the status here is, wow, that's, that's very directional. Um, we have two drafts that we've been working on actively on the mailing list. The first one um, is called, uh, hybrid terminology. We'll have a presentation on that later. Um, the reason for this, that that draft came up is that lots of different working groups are looking at w what's generally called hybrid use of post-quantum, and they were using the words differently. So we said, okay, this is a good central place for us to do this. Um, it is a working group item. We aren't quite done yet. P 
people keep getting good ideas, that's a good thing. We're not in a rush. Um, the second one is a document I originated many years ago that people in CFRG think still exists there, but it doesn't, um, that has come here, which is getting lots and lots of activity on the mailing list. This is, it's a hard document to write because it's, it's essentially, you know, post-quantum for people who don't know post-quantum or quantum for people who don't know quantum. Um, so how low of a level, how high of a level, we're getting great response on the mailing list. We want to keep that up. This document's going to be super valuable. It's, it's valuable now, but even at, once it's published, um, it's the kind of thing that folks in this room, when someone asks them, oh, well, what, you know, what is this quantum thing? You can hand this off to them. So, yep. Um, so I won't read the whole agenda. You can see it here. We are doing the first little bit. Um, and we've got four presentations or five today? We got five. five, five presentations. We will most likely not run out of time. Um, so the you know, AOB at the end, if you've got something you wanna say, something that you've noticed happening in other places, um, oh, I, are you about to object to our agenda? Great. Mike Ellsworth, shouldn't my name be on it? Shouldn't his name be on which? On which one? You asked me to present today, right? I yeah. submitted slides and stuff. Oh, so it's not really showing in the agenda, but I think we have you online, no? Um, <laughs> no. No, what we would like. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> so you will be last because that'll give me time while she runs the meeting to stick you in. So wait, if we have... No, okay, sorry, you did send in slides. I think that we actually overlaid you again with a different person. So yeah, so we'll put you up last. Yep, um, and, and again, we, uh, even with that, I think we will have plenty of time for AOB at the end. Okay, and I think that was our, your last slide. Yep, so we'll, we'll, we'll put up the AOB question mark slide at the very end. So with that, John Gray. Hello, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. So yeah, I'm here to talk about our PQNX 509 interoperability project. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so this started back actually a year ago in London. Um, so at IETF 115, a group of us got together because we thought, well, with all this PQ stuff coming, we want to make sure that we can work with each other's implementations. So we started, we thought, well, let's get together and start testing some of these new algorithms and you know, uh, see what comes from it. And so this project's actually grown quite a bit and it turns out um, the, the NIST uh, migration to post-quantum cryptography project, the NCCOE, is actually looking at us. So they have different subgroups. There's an X509 one and they actually are looking to us to provide um, outputs and uh, so, and we'd actually do that by interoperability testing. So I'm just gonna go through a little bit about the project that probably most of you know about it and I'll give an update on what happened this week. So you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know, so we have a GitHub repository. That was kind of the place we started. It's, it's actually in the IETF hackathon. Um, and the first thing we thought, okay, well, how are we gonna do this? How am I gonna make sure that if I wanna test something from you know, another person and I have created it, how are we gonna do that? Well, let's, let's create kind of an artifact format, a define a format that we're going to be able to use so that I can download other people's format and then I can run it against my code. So I have a description of that later. So we define an artifact repository and we store that. And as you can see on the right-hand side there, we have, right now we have 11 different providers. So a provider is someone that creates this artifact of, of PQ signatures, for instance, and uh, others can then, if, if you have an implementation you're working on and you just wanna test it, you can pull down one of those implementations and uh, you know, test it against your stuff. So that's one thing we have. We also have a prototype OID mapping table. That's very important because as you know, a lot of these algorithms, well, they're, they're new. They don't have OIDs defined by NIST yet. 
um, or just even define. So we need to agree on what hoids we're gonna use so that we can communicate. So we have that as well. So I'll show you a slide on that. And yeah, we also publish our results in a compatibility matrix for each type of algorithm. So we can move on. Yeah, so this is an example of our current artifact repository format. It's very simple, it's just a zip file. So um, we basically have a name, um, dash oid, actually the group probably needs to discuss that beginning part, but anyway, essentially you have the oid value dot TA, which represents a trust anchor. So it's a self-signed certificate. It's a, because with a self-signed certificate, when you do a verify, you basically check whether the signature is correct, whether it's not correct. Um, and we also have the end entities for Kyber because obviously it can't be signed because it's a chem. So it's signed by Dilithium too. So very simple format. We have documentation for it. And we also support the hybrid formats. Um, so there's an example of that too, where you combine different OID values. Um, we also have the catalyst and we have chameleon as well. So anyway, you can go to the next slide. I just wanna, it's very simple. You can, can take a look. So this is our OID mapping table. Um, so we recently just updated this um, when NIST came out on August 24th with their um, new, uh, draft standards for FIPS 204, 205, and uh, 203. So you can see on the left, that's the name that we call it. You notice there's a dash IPD against a lot of them. That's because we don't want to do a final definition because obviously we know those OIDs are going to change. Falcon obviously hasn't changed because there isn't a, uh, a draft of that yet from NIST, a final, well, a pre-final draft specification. Then we have the OIDs that we're using, and that's the next column. And then the third column tells you where they're coming from. So that's pretty self-explanatory. And there's a link to that too. So you can take a look at that. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so here's an example of some of the algorithms tested. So you just see a kind of a short snippet there. There's like eight of them. It's actually, you see if there's a scroll bar at the bottom, it actually looks very long. So there's a lot of algorithms we tested. If you go to the next slide, you'll see why because we've tested a lot of algorithms. Um, because some of these, like you might notice some of them are from, NIST has had a number of rounds, right? There's round two, there's round three. So the MLDSA 44 IPD, are they're the current ones, but the ones called dilithium, right? They were the round three ones, right? So we've been doing this for a year now. Um, so they have changed. That's why we have to have this OID mapping table or we're gonna run into issues when we try to test this. Then you can see on the right-hand side too, we've also tested different combinations of some of the, the composites and hybrids. So anyway, so there's, and, and we're open to testing more things too. I know there's a group that wants to test Entru, right? Um, and of course there's more algorithms coming. We know possibly McLeese or Bike or HQC or, you know, even that whole, whole new round that NIST has called for with the, like the Mayo algorithm and those things. So anyway, we're open to testing those. It's just, I mean, there's a lot of them. So next slide. And so this is an example of MLDSA 87, um, some of the testing that actually happened. This is pretty hot off the press this week. People were working on updating their, their implementations and, and recreating that, that zip format and then uploading them. And we have some scripts that, that basically can create these things. Um, so you can see there's four to five different implementations. So that's really good, right? So that's the ones that's compatible with the latest uh, NIST, I think 204. And uh, yeah, so there, you can see some columns, people are still working it. And you can see the company I work for, Entrust, is, doesn't have anything yet because I'm close to getting mine added, but not quite but next week I'll do that. Anyway, so that's just an example of what, what, that's just one, we have one for every single algorithm, right? So there's a, a page for, so that list of algorithms, we have one of these for each, every single one. So it's quite extensive. So you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so what got done, the important thing since IETF 117. So we actually had an intern virtual hackathon on September 30th. So on September 30th, there was eight people that showed up. It was all virtual. Um, it was on a Saturday, so people gave up their Saturday to come together. We like getting together. We have fun. And, um, yeah, so that was great. Um, the other thing, NIST, when they came out August 24th with their draft releases, we were like, okay, we need to update our, our OID repository, uh, at the OID, sorry, the OID mapping table. So we need to update that. So we did that. And then we decided, okay, what is the core we're doing? Because we had this zip format before where everything was getting thrown into the zip file. And we're like, well, what the core of this project is, is testing the PQ algorithms. The simplest way to do that is, and I showed you the format, is just to have the root self-signed roots and then have the, the uh, 
the end entities with Kyber, for instance, or other chems. So that's the core. Um, and you'll see later, we've actually even expanded to other zip file formats, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, let's see, yes, I think I said that. Yeah, the OID mapping table is updated. And all the other highlight too, and you've just seen it in the previous slide, we actually have four unique algorithm implementations of MLDSA. So it's not just everybody using libopenquantumsafe. I mean, a lot of people use that, but there's actually, there's Bouncy Castle, there's a PQ Shield and Crypto Next, I think as well. I think those are the four and Lib Open Quantum Safe. So it's actually a true, that this, we want that variety, right? So if you have an implementation of these algorithms, please join us. We would love to interop with you. So next slide, please. Yeah, so the, yeah, so we also added a table describing the source of the PQ algorithms, just like I said before, because before we didn't have that. Some people might think everyone's having their own unique. So if, if, when you go into that table, there's a link there. You can actually see, okay, this, you know, the Entrust, we use LibOpenQuantum Safe for ours at the moment, right? The PQ Shield, they have their own implementation, right? So you can actually see the source of the PQ algorithm. So that's useful. And yeah, so something, a new development, I guess, this past hackathon too, um, Alexander's been working on um, a CMP zip file format, right? So test the CMP protocol, and he's looking forward to even, even being able to use it as a, a CMP interoperable test suite, which would be great for those of us that implement CMP. Obviously, we're open to do that for other protocols if people are interested, like maybe CMC or other formats. But anyway, that's just a start, and yeah, so a couple other things that there's actually a few pages of slides. So the multi-auth for certificate finding implementation, that's a uh, draft and lamps so that's being worked on. And there's also, it didn't happen yesterday, but there's a new discovery draft and lamps as well that didn't get to be presented, but there's actually some discussions going on in the group, how maybe that discovery and multi-auth finding could work together. So this is, this is what happens when a table, of, you know, people get together, we start to think about things that are out there and even some new doc ideas come up. So we can go to the next slide. Yeah, so the, yeah, I like this, this is our table. Actually, we actually, at one point, we had three tables on the go. So you can actually see that one table full, the secondary one is full, and then there's a little bit on the third. So I showed you a bit of the new updated compatibility matrix. So that's obviously every time someone puts new artifacts and we want to get that updated. We had a good discussion, a little bit of a discussion on chameleon certificates, Russ came by. So anyway, you can ask us about that after. Um, uh, the first composite chem implementation was being developed by one of the people at the table. So that's great. Um, the composite signatures implementation, um, the, some of them are being updated to the new dash 10 version. And uh, yeah, and we had a bunch of discussions too at the table about uh, the, the composite signatures and uh, non-separability and those kinds of things. And that's, I mean, that's all good. That's all fruitful. Um, we need that. Um, so it's, it's kind of like there's the, we have the mailing list and we have kind of hackathon, right? That's another avenue where people get together and discuss things. So it's great. So next slide, please. And uh, yeah, so the, I think testing PQC protocol updates. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned a bit earlier, it's, it's, it's recognized that uh, PQC is not just, you know, for the algorithms themselves, every protocol and everything we're using today is going to have to be updated. So there is quite a lot of interest in um, some of these protocols being updated. I mentioned CMP before, uh, so there's been some up work done on CMP with some chem additions, that's, that's, there's a draft on that. Um, and, and some people have actually started to implement that. Um, CMS updates, so the chem redraft. So I, I, ha I have links to the drafts later on as well, and there's OCSP and there's others. And yeah, I mean, so again, the core of this is to test all the PQC stuff, but obviously they're used in protocols. So next slide. The other thing that a lot of members of our group are very interested in is how, how are we going to migrate people from, you know, existing where we are today or their customers, how are we going to migrate them to these new PQC algorithms? So some people might think some of us are crazy, but we are exploring, you know, different ways of doing migration mechanisms. So there's the binding for multi-auth, and I have the drafts linked here. There's the certificate discovery, chameleon certificates, composite signatures, composite chem, external public keys. Actually, a new one that just came up in the last couple of days, the Merkle tree ladder stuff. I think there could be some really interesting use cases there as well. So there's some discussions going on about that as well. So it's kind of also, I guess you could say, we do a lot of talking at the hackathons, right? So in some ways, that's even more value, right? There's a lot of brainstorming going on. And uh, yeah. The other thing is, uh, just at the last point, 
you'll see, you're going to see Antonio is going to present on the PQIP, PQ use cases document. So if we come up, you know, as part of this process, use cases that, that make sense and are valuable, we could actually put them into that draft, right? So, and I think I'm getting towards the end. Yeah, so the summary. Yeah, it's a, it's a great group to be part of. This is our team. Often we have a, you know, a hackathon dinner afterwards on a Sunday. This time we actually ended up having two <laughs> dinners on two different days. So I guess we'd like to get together and have fun. Um, so we, we're going to continue to progress on this. The next meeting we have, so we have meetings monthly, um, just for an hour and talk about where we are on the project. Uh, so the next one is Tuesday, December 5th. And uh, there's some discussions of possibly a new virtual interim hackathon. If that happens, it'll probably be towards the end of January, kind of in between the, the next IETF. We're doing compatibility matrix updates and we have our GitHub page there. And then you can go to the last slide where I say, join us. So if you're doing PQC stuff and you wanna test things, join us. We have a lot of fun doing this. You can see in the slide that Max Pella is, you can see him, that kind of, I see that and that's kind of what I think about when I think about our team. I just see, I mean, we have a lot of fun. It's in solving important problems for this world, right? And we need to work together, right? So anyway, that's my update. Great. Thank you. Who would have thought interoperability was so much fun? <laughs> it is, it's lots of fun. So any questions? Any questions? And again, for if you want to get into the mic line, you need to use the tool. Um, quite frankly, questions should definitely go. Um, raise your hand if you are an active part of the hackathon. Just so, and so if you have questions, look around and grab one of the people near you. Sorry. Um, thank you. Uh, look around for the people. Raise your hand if you if you're interested in the hackathon and such like that. Um, you guys did pretty well at the last. In <laughs> I am. Look, <laughs> um, you guys did pretty well at the last virtual hackathon as well, right? That you yes. had a lot. Yeah. We had so eight people come. Yeah. Um, that's good prep for, especially since some people aren't are considering not going to Brisbane. Um, that would be, you know, uh, this is very active, even though you, even not at the face to face hackathons. And Chris, um, yeah. Uh, just a question what, the, regarding the other algorithms that people want, want to test. Do you know which, which which are the other algorithms that people want to test? Uh, I know N true is one of them. Um, I've heard uh, Frodo could be one of them. I know there's parts of the world that want to use that. We know there's new algorithms coming, right, with the next NIST round. So, yep. Stateful hash? Yeah, oh, yeah, stateful hash base could be as well there hasn't been anyone that has done that yet but that's definitely possible right. actually if you could just back up one slide just i want to so i didn't mention here but all these people here and i i hope i've captured most of them i probably missed some people we probably had about 30 people join us but for the first timers this time i always like to spell them out so dimitri bella ski sorry i, I didn't help you right. can take my name paul hoffman that. you did you did come i did and, come and, and i didn't have did you, but I mean, we talked and stuff. Yes. Pravik, Sharma came, Nicola Tuveri, Justice Winter, and I've probably forgotten some. So anyone that's helped out with this project, thank you. Mike? Mike Ellsworth. I'm just going to sort of answer Chris's question indirectly. The way you get an algorithm on the list, one person needs to submit it, a different person needs to test it and, pr and produce a check mark or a cross for it. As long yeah. as we have one producer and one consumer, it's in the list. Great. Yeah, so you'll see. Uh, I'm sorry, and, is, and it is post-quantum. You don't want people throwing an elliptic curve. Well, so. well someone did uh, do an actually, EC. <laughs> actually not true, because it's useful to test baseline that we can actually just interrupt, period. So we, Fair do, point. we do have all the classicals in there, and like some of the composites, we do RSA with EC to make sure the structural stuff works, and okay. we all have AIAs set up properly. and all. Right, the so make sure your baseline. classical side is working before you check your hybrid. Okay. Yes. Very good. Great. So, uh, I think that's it. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. And again, th for those of you who are new here, um, th this working group is supposed to not be pr producing protocols, but having activity. This is a really great example of activity, and we're about to see some more. Um, so the first working group document um, that we're talking about is uh, the hybrid schemes and flow.
Hi everyone, um, I'm Flo from the UK NTSC. Um, I just want to set expectations. This presentation has no pictures of really happy implementers. <laughs> All the slides look like this. So, you know, just that's where we're starting. There are, there are, there are no photos at all, to be honest. It's, it's a big disappointment. Um, cool, so this is the terminology for post-quantum traditional hybrid schemes. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, so I think most people um, have probably been to one of these meetings before, um, but if you haven't, the idea here is that this is an informational draft to standardize a kind of glossary or a vocab list for post-quantum traditional hybrids, which admittedly does take quite a long time to say, but it's terminology, so I should say all the words. Um, the aim is to ensure that we've got consistency across different protocols within the ITF and where possible across different standards and organizations, although of course, you know, it's limited the control we can have there. It, we're also, I'm also trying to make it clear what security properties a particular hybrid construction claims um, so that we can kind of assess appropriately a hybrid against the properties that it claims it has. Um, and the third aim is to enable kind of easier comparison of solutions. This, doc this document is just terminology. It's not proposing any solutions itself. This was adopted by PQIP a couple of meetings ago. Um, and since the last meeting, we've had an update, which I'm going to talk through today. Cool. So zero one version, um, kind of just as a summary. Um, the biggest change, which I'll come on to in a bit more detail in a minute, um, is adding some new definitions for properties of post-quantum hybrid signature schemes. Um, so this is mainly inspired by um, Britta Hale and Nina Bindle's paper, a note on hybrid signature schemes. Um, so what I've tried to do is to transpose some of the language that was in there um, and move it into this draft so that we can use it in the ITF. Um, I've also added some alternative language for the basic definition. So we've had some discussions before about like, do you want to say post-quantum or quantum resistant or quantum safe? So I think at the last meeting, we sort of settled on the headline terms. But what I've done here is just added the, you may also hear these terms underneath there to try and capture some of that discussion. Um, updating references, updating naming, um, and removing some editor's notes, which I'll also come on to in a minute. Um, on the naming, so it's kind of taught, been talked about through the week, um, like Kyber is not the same as MLChem and Dilithium is not the same as MLDSA. But in the context of this draft, these are just, they're kind of placeholders for, this is an example of a post-quantum chem. So we do want to have the, the terms that will be standardized by NIST in the long term. Cool, next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go into any detail on these new definitions because um, I'm gonna leave that to Deirdre's talk later. Um, but we've added these new definitions um, for um, properties that hybrid schemes might have. Um, there's more detail on this, as I say, in draft hail PQIP hybrid signature spectrums, which there'll be a presentation on later. Um, I'm also conscious that these definitions need some updates. Um, and I know that Britt has got some comments. There's been some comments on the list. So I'll be adding those following this meeting. Cool. Next, please. So yeah, editor's notes. So you can't publish a draft as an RFC when it's got editor's notes in it. So I took all the editor's notes out. Um, no, seriously, so there were three editor's notes. Um, one of those was this point about, should we distinguish between source authentication and identity authentication? So this was kind of trying to capture the idea of in a certificate chain, you are, um, you are attesting both to the identity of the user through the certificate chain and also to the source through the signature on the message or um, the exchange. This kind of felt important to me when I started writing the draft, but there's been no comments on it. It's not really something we pull apart anywhere else. So I've decided that we can just remove it. If people disagree, well, please suggest some um, definitions and I'll add them back in. Um, Edison note two, um, which was, should we define more properties? We've done that. Um, again, if people think there are more properties we should define, happy to add them. Um, and then the third one was about if we wanted a definition of more concepts around um, hybrid, sig hybrid certificates. Um, there were no comments, so I removed the editor's note. But since I removed the editor's note, there have been a few suggestions that we add definitions for a mixed certificate chain. So a certificate chain that includes a mix of post-quantum certificates, post-quantum traditional hybrid certificates, and or traditional certificates. Any of that just kind of catch all. So we can do that. 
Um, and also one for adding something about multi-cert authentication. Um, so I plan to add those in the next version as well. Next, please. So that's kind of where we are. There's some edits that I've mentioned based on feedback on the zero one, um, which I plan to make. Um, please do suggest any more on the mailing list. Um, I'm also interested to know from the group what more people think we should be doing or we need to do um, to ask for working group last call. Um, clearly the draft's not quite there yet. There's things to do. But kind of if people think there are substantial things, definitions need to be added, things need to be considered, that would be really useful to know so that we can keep stepping in that direction. Cool. That's me. Um, do you think we might have those two in a month, a couple months? Um, I think we can have it up in a month. Yeah. Uh, Mike. Mike Ellsworth, Entrust. So on the, on the working group last call thing, I think this document is doing really good work just by existing. Lots of documents are referencing it and saying at the top, I use terminology from. Sorry. Ooh, yeah, okay. Uh, I think this document is doing a lot of good work just by existing. A lot of other documents are saying at the top, we use terminology from here. Um, but it's obviously still evolving. So I think it's premature to, to call this a closed dictionary. Um, I guess we'll have a conflict when the first thing that references it tries to go to, mm. yeah, all right. Mm. Good. <laughs> Scott? Yes, Scott Fleur, Cisco Systems. Uh, uh, it occurs to me that this uh, uh, needs to be updated long term. I'm wondering if, an, uh, if I'd put, making this, uh, freezing this as an RFC is appropriate or we treat, keep this open as a living document. Were we about to have an AD interrupt on that question? Okay. All right. We'll start Gili. Oh, thank you. Oh. Yeah, so here is Gili uh, from Huawei International Singapore. Uh, so I do have uh, two short comments on the definition, two definitions. So first is about the traditional algorithms. Yeah, I mean, crypto algorithms. Yeah, so in the current version, I think, it is just the defined RSA and DSA is the traditional algorithm. I think this is not logical, right? Because we have tons of uh, traditional algorithms there. Maybe a lot of them not standardized, but they are still traditional algorithms. So these two are just two typical yeah, representative algor traditional algorithms. So I once I mentioned this one long time ago, but I maybe missed the further discussion about this. So maybe we can discuss later how to rewrite this one. Yeah. Um, you know my point? I'm, but yeah, yeah, happy to have a kind of a further discussion about it. Um, I think it would be a useful one to have on the mailing list because I think it's quite complicated. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the definition we use at the moment is a um, asymmetric algorithm, which is based off um, integer factorization or um, discrete log. Um, so we don't specify RSA and Diffie-Hellman, but we kind of hint strongly in that direction. Um, obviously, using traditional or traditional cryptographic algorithm is a really broad term. Um, but we don't, I don't think we necessarily want to refer to kind of every single algorithm ever here. So, yeah, I think it'd be a useful discussion to have on the list because I don't know what the right outcome is. But, yeah, let's take it further. Yeah, okay. The second one is actually about the multi-algorithm scheme. I don't know whether this is a good one, or maybe we give another def definition like a uh, multi-component uh, scheme, because a uh, multi-algorithm scheme, yeah, sounds like uh, it is just a scheme, uh, consists of uh, multi-algorithms, and these algorithms maybe not necessary, the same same kind of uh, component, yeah, just like uh, multi-signatures. Yeah, signatures, you can say the multi-algorithm or multi-component algorithms. Um, yeah, so I, you, you made some comments on the list about this, and I, I tried to update the definitions um, in response to your, to your comments. Um, mm -hmm. So I think if you, could, you know, if you take a look and sort of see whether we've got close enough, what more you'd like to change, and then, again, if yeah, you do this on the I list, that, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, later. Yeah, thank okay. you. Philip. Hello. Uh, if you go back to the editor's uh, notes uh, slide, um, 
Yeah, I think actually there is a utility in distinguishing between the two, source authentication and identity authentication. In the, if you have a lot of documents, you can do the identity authentication on the key once and then apply it to multiple individual documents. So that's one area where it's useful. But more generally, if the signature on this particular document fails, well, there's no recovery. If, however, I've got a signature on the document, well, I know that in the PKIX world, you have the certificate chain, and that is the chain, and that's it. But that's not the only PKI world that we necessarily live in. And if we're going to think about things with, things with clarity, I think that in the, as we move into the PQ world, we're going to be looking at other ways of authenticating, mm -hmm. of validating the key, and that will come in useful. For example, if you pickle an elliptic curve key in a blockchain, oh God, I said that word, sorry. Um, if you pickle it today, well, you can be pretty sure that that signature, that key was valid 20 years hence if it was a dilithium key. Of course, it was elliptic curve when you involved, tough. But so I, I, I think that there is utility in maintaining that distinction. Um, if, if you have kind of, because to be perfectly honest, I wrote that editor's note like six months ago. And I think when I wrote it, it made perfect sense to me. And now I read it and I can't 100% remember what I meant. So, um, so if you have particular thoughts or particular use cases, it would be helpful to, to chat about that or to, to get something written. Thank you. And not just particular use cases. Since Phil, you're probably the, the one who's thought about what definition you would want the most. Propose words, even if people are going to attack the words, if it comes with words and use cases, that would be super helpful. Thank you. Hi, Roman Danilo. I came up to the mic to talk about just a little bit about process and explore the process options, given some of, the, some of what I heard. Uh, you know, a little bit I heard is let's work in group last call, let's kind of publish. The other heard, I mean, I heard the other end of the continuum living kind of document. I just want to remind the group there may be an in-between option. And this, it's an option a little bit that we see when we have a protocol document and we want to wait for field experience and implementation experience. So the pattern there is we take the document, we work in group last call the document. So we're, we say, given what we know now, we're very, very comfortable with the words, but we want to wait just in case. And so you could work in group last call it. You could then say, let's park it for six months and kind of one year and then if we're if things are exactly how we we think we are or whatever that time duration is we can then go forward and that might be a halfway point so Rome, before right. you go yeah. uh, the question and and mike had brought this up and i pointed at him he got it right other documents are referring to this one and and, and they will probably move forwards sure. um do you feel comfortable with a standards track algorithm or protocol document that says I'm using the same um, terminology as this one, and this one is still a draft. Because I would imagine terminology should in fact be nailed, I mean, especially if they're calling out this good terminology, that should be nailed down. But I also agree with the idea, the sort of evolving idea of living documents. So this is gonna come on you, so can you guess now for us? especially uh, for us chairs. Sure, I, I can officially kind of answer if you have made the reference obviously as a normative reference because it's so crucial to what you've done in the protocol, the, the protocol document is gonna sit in misrep which is gonna make a lot of folks unhappy and that is likely not an outcome we want. And so if we are in that situation, we should publish and make a this if it turns out we were wrong. So in, in normative versus informative does matter. So uh, with, with normative, it'll sit in misref. If it's informative, it'll publish. Okay. The, 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 the protocol uh, document will move forward. So then I would ask you and Paul Wouters to look for that as you are processing other documents. And if you're getting a feeling that we're supposed to push this forwards, so we can do a working group last call at some point, but then we need to get it to you. There's delay and such. Sure. If you and Paul can be looking for that, since we're not looking at all the documents you're sure. looking at. Yeah, no, right. that's fair. And I'd also just as a process thing, uh, we remind like if there, there's no harm in working group last calling it kind of twice. So if we think we're kind of close, we can just work through last call kind of as well. And we could do it again if we need to. So the, so the queue is closed. Um, so take it to the list will be my advice to Andrew and Mike. We will move to the next presentation, but thank you so much, Flo. <laughs> uh, we have Arita, Aritra.
Oh, hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in. Yeah, we'll be I'll be presenting uh, post quantum cryptography for engineers. Uh, at this stage, we have received uh, like a lot of uh, reviews and feedback, and there has been a lot of contributions. So it's essentially truly a group document at this point. So yeah, uh, move forward. Yeah, uh, a quick recap of the draft to those who are joining PICWIP for the first time. It explains why engineers need to be aware and understand post-quantum cryptography and how the migration work. And it emphasizes that the impact of Cryptographically relevant quantum computers is the key term here on the current cryptographic systems and the need to transition to post-quantum algorithms. And this was adopted by the working group after the last meeting at IETF 117. Yeah. Uh, we have we made some small changes since the IETF uh, 117 meeting. We added in a section of authenticated key exchange. Uh, uh, which we'll be talking about later. And uh, we added in some well terminologies for the post-quantum versus quantum ready resistant uh, uh, because there was a discussion in the working group and there was some discussions about how to put these two terms in the context of post-quantum cryptography. We added a small section of Ike V2 as well uh, and which refers the RFC 9242 that actually well, uh, it helps fragment large public key sizes for post-quantum key exchanges. Uh, next one. Uh, we also added in a chem-based AKE diagram as well. So for uh, post-quantum KEMs, like I'm not talking about single-sided KEMs, for post-quantum KEMs to achieve uh, authenticated key exchange there, there needs to be two full KEM exchanges that are performed and they're essentially combined with a, a combined, basically a KEM combined to form a sh single shared secret, which is unlike say uh, Diffie-Hellman KEM, which has like the Nike and the AKE property. And uh, how the combiner or how complex the combiner should be, it actually depends on the cryptographic property required. And there are some discussions in other working groups on uh, especially the KEM combiner topics. Yeah. Mm, next one. Uh, yeah. So, well, I think uh, Flo sort of covered this slide uh, with the name change from Kyber, Dilithium, and Sphinx Plus uh, is one of the things that was discussed and obviously we should change the names, but we sh but from the Falcon point of view, we should also wait for the draft for name change to Falcon and any objections, uh, you can just uh, uh, please bring it up. Uh, next one. Yeah, uh, there was one other interesting topic that was I think brought by Paul here that the hardware acceleration for PQC chems should a section or subsection be added to the draft, it's a working group suggestion, so it's uh, it's open to discussion. I'd be happy to uh, take some suggestions. Yeah, next one. Uh, so we are planning to make some changes after the meeting. We plan to have a small paragraph or a, a section on comparing the stateful hash-based signature sizes to provide basically a comparison to Sphinx Plus. Now, uh, we received some comments on the RSA 10 second topic, uh, which was there was a sentence about stable qubit breaking RSA 2048, qubits taken to break it in 10 seconds. Uh, since there was no academic reference, we decided to uh, remove it as suggested by the working group. And there was also a sentence on quantum side channel attack or frozen smart card attacks, which was suggested to be removed as well. Uh, next steps, we'll be addressing, obviously, the open issues that are there in the mailing lists. Uh, we think the document might be ready for a working group last call next year after the Brisbane. Maybe NIST might have, uh, uh, I mean, the NIST drafts might have been finalized or later on in the 2024. And uh, I think, yeah. Uh, and next slide. Yeah, we, uh, comments and suggestions are always welcome. Just please raise a PR and contribute. And thank you to all the contributors and reviewers who have contributed and collaborated till now. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have 3D in the queue. Hi, I can suggest it on the GitHub, but uh, what's that? Oh, my name is Deirdre. Um, <laughs> The update from Kyber to ML Chem changes the uh, commitment to the ciphertext. Uh, 
it may not i just did a quick grab on the the live version of the document it may not be relevant to all the things you're explaining in that document but i think it would be useful to have that kind of note in there that you know we have several documents that have relied on the fact that kyber b3 or whatever did commit to the cipher text and now the thing that's actually going to be ml cam no longer does and now they have to kind of run around and double check that they don't need that or whatever so i suggest that we yeah. just add a note about that yeah, put some context yes. uh, beneath yeah it's perfect thanks so uh i propose we actually do more than just a note okay. because that is i mean one of the things people are going to look at this document for is not just the terminology but how did we get you know as David Byrne said, well, how did I get here? Um, that's a very important thing for people who stopped reading in 2023. So something that says between 2023 and 2024, these changes happen. We don't have to go into the technical description, but saying there were some alerts for them. And, and if there are similar ones that might come up in the next couple of months for, uh, for the um, signature algorithm as well. I think that's actually very relevant for people learning about, you know, what's going on here is that there were changes before the very end. Yeah. Um, and then one other note, um, I wasn't at CFRG, but apparently this week, uh, the old, old version of this that I wrote appeared on the CFRG list as, oh, we don't know what's going on. Maybe you can tell them that you've taken this over. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, thanks. And also, there is a working group item already up equip. Just, yeah, just yeah, let's yeah. see if yeah, I can yeah. know. Yes. Just, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, drop, I'll drop a mail. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see anyone else in the queue. So there you go. So thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Up next, we have Dride with hybrid signature spectrums. I'll get your slide. I'm back. Hey, cool. Uh, hi, I'm Deirdre Connolly. I'm from Sandbox AQ. Uh, we're presenting a new document about hybrid signature spectrums. It is a high level document with security properties, notions you should be aware of, approaches to creating hybrid post quantum and traditional signature schemes, um, and other things like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, We've been in other working group meetings where things like hybrid chems are much more pressing because we want to stave off uh, store and decrypt later attacks. Uh, but we do know that you know it takes a long time to update all these existing signature schemes deployed out in the wild. So while uh, you know risks to traditional authentication from a cryptographically relevant quantum computer is further in the future. Uh, we do want to figure out how to do this now so that we can analyze them, pick the appropriate approaches for our different protocols uh, and battle test them and get them rolled out. Uh, next, please. Um, there are several notions that are distinct from hybrid chems or other hybrid algorithmic approaches uh, that are distinct to hybrid signatures. Um, that we wanted to go through before people start constructing things kind of willy-nilly, um, including several properties about the separability or non-separability of the component algorithm schemes as part of these constructions. Uh, next. Oh, no. Yeah. Did you get disconnected? I'm not sure. Oh, no. A moment, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I don't know what happened. But okay. <laughs> uh, next, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I forget what this was about. Um, this is very high level. It is not proposing specific constructions or kinds of constructions. It's describing some of the options and some of the considerations. It's not proposing anything concrete. Uh, for the moment. This is supposed to be informational to help guide other such work. Uh, next, please. So we elucidate many of these goals of what these hybrid signature schemes are trying to achieve. Um, next, please. Some of these are kind of 
they do what they say on the tin, but several of the ones that, meant, that Flo mentioned earlier uh, are these kind of newer notions, uh, weak non-separability, strong non-separability, simultaneous verification, and hybrid generality. Um, I'll get to the non-separability stuff in, in a moment. Um, simultaneous ver verification is if you have a hybrid scheme uh, with you know, a traditional and a post-quantum component algorithm, um, ideally, in the strongest cases, uh, you will not be able to verify uh, either one of those two component signature scheme algorithms uh, independent of each other. You want them all to verify together because you are defining a hybrid scheme. It's supposed to be one signature scheme in theory, um, so it should be simultaneously verifying. Uh, and next one being hybrid generality. It's nice if these things can be created without, uh, while relying on the same security notions of these you know, security proofs um, so that we can compose them together without having to go back to the blackboard and write a whole new security proof from scratch. So that's kind of the general notion. Uh, and next, please. Um, and now non-separability. So these hybrid schemes are being constructed from multiple existing uh, signature schemes of some sort, usually tradi one traditional, like your Schnorr, your ECDSA, uh, and something that's post-quantum, like dilithium or Falcon. Um, when you're shoving these two schemes together, um, you can have a range of notions of, can you separate them apart? Um, if you have no non-separability, they are fully separable. So if you just smush two signature schemes together and didn't do anything else about them, you could, in theory, just strip one of them off, like your PQ one, and then hand the message and signature and public key to uh, a verifier you would like to trick and be like, verify the signature, please. And they will never have any indication that this was supposed to be hybrid. This will verify fine. There's no other indication or artifact that this was supposed to be part of a hybrid scheme. So that's fully separable, no non-separability. The next step up is weak non-separability. There is some artifact somewhere, either in the message that you're assigning, the signature scheme itself, something higher level in the protocol or the application layer that indicates that this thing is supposed to be part of a hybrid scheme. One example is you literally have a prefix label to every message that you sign that says, I am being signed as part of hybrid Falcon, Schnorr, or whatever, so that you can try to separate your Falcon and your Schnorr, but the verification will fail if you're not signing over a message that has the prefix, I am supposed to be part of a, a hybrid Falcon Schnorr hybrid scheme. So that's better than nothing. The next one is strong non separability artifacts existing in the signature scheme itself, which are basically the signature components will not verify uh, if they don't have this notion of the hybridness being in there. So like they will fail even if you try to, to strip them. Um, and then the next, the, the biggest one is strong non-separability with simultaneous verification. So you get that strong non-separability and you get the two schemes must verify at the same time. It's not one then the other, because if you have one then the other, you can just stop at the first one and yay, you can just pawn off a classical algorithm when you're supposed to have a hybrid algorithm and things like that. So these are some of the details that we're going into in this document and to help designers and updaters of their protocols wrestle with what they need from their signature scheme and not just, I'm gonna smush these things together and, and call it a day. Uh, next, please. So please read it. <laughs> There's more stuff in there than just non-separability. There's this sort of uh, going into detail about artifacts, where artifacts live. There's, as I said, message, signature scheme itself, uh, and going into further notions about you know, general approaches of how to construct these things, but also where you indicate the hybridness of these schemes so that you can detect it. Um, and kind of a little bit of guidance of like, well, what if I have all these like FIPS verified things and these requirements and like I, I'm constrained by some of these things. We go into a little bit in, the, in a section in there, um, but please read it and let us know if there's something in there that you need that you have questions about. We're not going to shove a like, here is a generic way to construct signature schemes in this document, but we think it will help inform anything like that that might exist in the future. Uh, next, links. 
Uh, and next one, that's it. Questions? So it's Scott. Uh, Scott Flores, Cisco Systems. Uh, I went. I went through the dra draft pretty quickly. I did not see any place where you meant where you talked about whether or not uh, the, uh, the the hybrid could be implemented by using uh, black box implementations of the underlying signature systems. Ah, uh, we should mention that we've been discussing that with some yeah. of the lamps people. Um, so I think we can add something in there at least with that language, mm -hmm. because there's stuff in there that would basically, if you know what you're reading, implies something like that, but we can make it explicit. Uh, and another thing, comment which you may want to consider uh, is talking about pre-hashing, which is basically mm. uh, 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 having the, uh, the, the, the message being hashed and then give the, give the, ha the hash to both underlying with possibly some mucks ups. Mm -hmm. okay. John? Yeah, hi. Nice to, uh, actually, nice to see you. Um, as one of the authors on the composite signatures draft, um, I was just wondering, like, so the construction of that artifact is very important, and we're actually learning that yeah. from you and your associates, Britta. We've talked a lot to her. So we're actually wondering if perhaps you said, this isn't the place, but I, there's a, like, there's a chem combiners draft in CFRG. Where yeah. We're just wondering if maybe a draft in CFRG that discusses that component of it, maybe for CFRG, and then our draft could just point to that and say, as a part of our construction for our, you know, this label, or we're calling it the OID now because we're using an OID, but whatever it ends up being, yeah. I think it needs to be stronger, could be just refer to that draft and then we should be good. I'm, I'm he hearing from multiple people a desire to have something like that. Uh, can you skip a for uh, forward? I have extra slides. So, we have, it, it doesn't jump out at you in our draft, but we have these examples of approaches. The, the regular schmegular concatenation, next. Nesting, which you yeah. may have seen in yeah. some uh, FIDO2 PQ hybrid variants, use a form of nesting. And then next one, fully fused hybrid. Uh, we think we might just kind of bust this out into a CFRG thing. Because yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense because we're having a lot of discussions on that. Actually. And then, and then the artifact stuff, yeah. which yeah, can't can't go anywhere without it. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Jonathan. Jonathan should be online. Um, am I next? Yes. Um, yes okay. Uh, so I have a, a question. Is there a notion of somehow in between? weak and strong, where you can strip off one of the signatures, but not the other? I think that is literally, well, if you can detect that this was supposed to be hybrid, but the signature will still verify, I think that's weak non-separability, but you have to check with my co-authors on that. Yeah, Britta can help me. I think we have our reply. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I put my name in the queue. We can take it down now for this. Uh, yes, so, so there is a variance of this weak non-separability that I think can be refined. Uh, we can even get into like EUF yeah. CMA style or SUF CMA style non-separability in different combinations. Uh, so it's kind of the question of how far we want that refined in a draft like this, if it should be left high level. And that can be discussed on the list. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Wait, Andrew? Yeah, I, I don't know if you had it in your draft or not. I haven't read it yet, and I will. But uh, do you have the concept of cryptographic separation when using, say, two different hashing algorithms? Or, or no, it's the same algorithm, but using it in two places? Uh, we don't get into that, the like, the guts of those signature schemes in this document, I think that would be something that would be in a CFRG document, especially when we, if we were to write up something about this fused approach where you really do have to separate your hash functions or your, you know, your models of your random oracles, um, maybe you don't need to think about that in some of the other approaches but that's a good thing to to think about for yeah, I wonder a if it's CFRG a common document. enough problem that you should have to mention it. Was that? I was wondering if it's a common enough problem that it might need to be in your document. I think it would probably need to be discussed for a CFRG-ish uh, 
approaches document. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next, we have Tom. Online. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, to sort of follow up on what Jonathan was saying, I think that um, in all of these combinations of signature algorithms, the algorithms are probably not equal uh, in the sense that um, some of them are more maybe for short-term use than on long-term use. So I think that defining these, uh, we, you can maybe take off the Diffie-Hellman one, but as long as you can't take off the post-quantum one type properties uh, are very useful and maybe easier to realize because that is the question of, do you first sign with the uh, elliptic curve one and then sign with Kyber, uh, sign with Kyber, sign with the lithium. <laughs> um, is, is uh, or if you do that the other way around, you get very different properties in terms of the breakage uh, and taking off the post quantum one is probably worse. Um, but yeah, I've had a lot of discussions about this and it's very much uh, all of the problems with doing any of this seem related to uh, the reason why people want to have separate signatures, namely all sorts of backwards compatibility reasons, which is very annoying. Uh, we didn't specifically write up these kind of more nuanced notions of non-separability depending on which scheme goes first in some of these nested constructions. But if we do get into like a CFRG document about approaches, we may have to discuss that. Um, because in the cat concatenation approach, that's kind of not, uh, not really an issue in the Nested approach, it definitely is an issue. In the fused one, it's not an issue. So like, yeah, we can go into those details if we actually start writing these things up for CFRG. Okay, great. We don't have anyone in the queue anymore. So thank you very much, Ride. Thank you. Um, up next, we have Antonio for post-quantum cryptography use cases. Uh, like Hi everybody. So I'm I'm Antonio. Oops. Okay. Hi everybody. I'm Antonio Vira from Siemens. So okay, I'll look at that. Next, please. So I would say a couple of years ago we started discussing within our company uh, what is PQC? What shall we do with it? What should our business units do with it? And we started to face some issues meaning there is so much out there, there, is, there are so many use cases, and how even to convince our colleagues that one, one approach might be better than another or in which direction to investigate further. So we started to somehow put together a list of use cases that could be representative enough, let's say, for, with respect to our expertise, of course, but we didn't go farther than that. Then at the last ITF, uh, so I met with John and we started discussing <laughs> if such a document would actually be useful and if it could bring any help, bring any clarity, especially when discussing all the various migration aspects and um, I would say PQC technologies out there in combination with the various use cases and help us identify what the best strategies would be. So that's where this document come from um, if you had the chance to read it, you will see it's still in its infancy, but we are very much intention to, to, to fill it in, to provide more text and to populate it. And next, please. Um, yes, so the food, I mean, this document has the main objectives to really, as was briefly mentioned, to help make order. Uh, to make order among all the various use cases that we have out there and basically create a kind of matrix use cases um, versus the various approaches, I would say, and help identify pros and cons. So as you can imagine, we started putting in use cases with which we are familiar. So typically in my company, we speak always about very long lived things so certificates that are, for example, in, in imprinted and manufacturing time and are supposed to be validated for a very long time, or maybe trust anchors then end up in some device somewhere 
and that might be very hard to update. Um, and that's more or less where we're coming from. But, but of course, this should not be the, we should not limit ourselves to only these use cases when writing this document. And of course, um, I would say a very non-trivial uh, source of headaches is how to comply with multiple regulations, because you might also have different regulations depending on the, the regions in which you deploy your products. So that kind of makes everything much more interesting. Next, please. And so we thought that such document could help us, but hopefully could help everybody. And, and as I was saying, we started from, um, at, at least in, in theory, from a very limited set of use cases, but I mean, we can enlarge the list and go beyond what's our expertise. And we thought, what better venues than PQIP to actually start these discussions, so to, to work on this document. Um, yes, the four, that's why I've, I'm talking to you today. And um, just to give you a couple of examples, of course, we are interested in understanding how multiple certificates, uh, public key certificates could be used, how hybrid composite, hybrid non-composite, but even looking into a stateful and uh, non-stateful hash-based signature algorithms, um, where can we use them? So how can we use them uh, in a way that is, well, secure? And we also think that this document could actually be a nice companion to the um, uh, PQC for engineers. Just an idea. Just an idea. Um, and also, ideally, this document should be a living document. So something that should grow over time and cover as much ground as possible. Next, please. Oh. Yeah, so the next step we, we think would make sense is, of course, to continue work on it and to develop. Uh, before we're asking anybody in the audience or to join us, to provide us use cases or to join as a co-author and to contribute. The document is available um, also in, um, in, on GitHub. And the idea eventually is to really use this content to discuss migration strategies, basically using a common ground, uh, a shared ground. And actually I have a backup slide, I think it might might be interesting to just mention it very briefly. Uh, to give a very concrete example, a uh, few weeks ago I was speaking with a, with a colleague in, that is working on building automation and that uses a very specific uh, protocol, an industrial protocol. And uh, I would say the nice thing you know, about this protocol is that it points to a lot of RFCs. So in theory, um, if, for example, we decide to use, just an example, composite certificates, then we could have hybrid compliance to hybrid uh, cryptography that is required in certain regions, so in certain uh, area, basically for free. And this would be an example. Of course, in other, if this product then would be used in other regions where hybrid should not be used, then, uh, yeah. That's a, different, that's a different topic. Anyway, just wanted to give a very concrete uh, example where pretty much the discussion started. Um, I would say in the document, the use cases are listed at a very high level and this is intentional, so to, to not enter in too much detail. And that's it. Thank you very much, Antonio. I don't see anyone on the queue. Is it queuing up? No. No, okay. <laughs> With that then, thank you very much, Antonio. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, just, as, just as a note, um, there are lots of different places where there are use cases. I, it might, like we can't do every single use case. And, and again, this may just be a living document, but I was just at a meeting a month ago for the GSMA and the telco people have a very different set of use cases that they are studying. It would be nice to, to make this a larger collection. Um, and then so, I did get you on the agenda at the very end. I'm sorry, it's not, not on the slides, but there we go. So I guess I'll cue jump on the last topic. So I'm also an author on the 
use cases thing. We were trying to collect sort of at least one example of each type in order to motivate lamps, right? Why are you even submitting this? Well, we'll be like at least one of each type. I'm not trying to make an exhaustive list of everything crypto is used for everywhere, but. Okay. Um, this is a talk that was requested by Paul and Sophia. I will say that of all the talks I've given this week, this is the one I am the least confident about the content for. I am going to attempt to summarize all of the hybrid chem drafts across IETF, which is starting to be many. They are more similar than they are different. So the differences are very technical and very subtle, and I hope that I can get them correct. Um, I've done many revisions of these slides fixing nits, <laughs> but four of them this morning. <laughs> so thank you to everyone who emailed me this morning and prompted those changes. All right, let's let's see yeah, at least see if we can get this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna compare these six drafts: CFRG Chem Combiners, that's mine; TLS Hybrid Design, that's uh, Stabila et al.; uh, CFRG PK, P, HPKE Cyber. That's Boss and Chris Wood. Uh, Lamps Composite Chem, that's myself and my co-authors. Open PGP, that's Aaron and Stavros and Falco, I think. Uh, and then Jose Hybrid Encrypt, that's the Nokia guys. Um, and I hope I get the details right. So I've tried to capture here the purpose of these drafts and the purpose column, there is an important distinction in that some of these are trying to achieve ephemeral key exchanges and some of these are trying to achieve long lived encryption public keys. And I don't fully understand myself the extent to which that matters for protocol design, but I think it is worth calling out whether it's meant to be single use or multi-use public keys. The combiners look structurally different in a couple of cases, but as we go through the, I'll go through the, the actual constructions in detail, they actually are more similar than they look on this slide. But this is where they get, this gets tricky because there's the footnotes have footnotes on, on some of these things and their security properties. So the nice thing is the bottom three just use the CFRG draft directly, which is exactly what we intended that to be. Um, and I'll note there is an errata on this slide. The bottom corner, Jose Hybrid Encrypt, that should be KMAC 256. That was a change made recently that I didn't get in these slides. Okay, next. So here's the other interesting angle to this. Um, one that I know Russ in particular has opinions about is are the algorithm choices, are the cipher suites aligned between working groups? And Russ is, keeps making a point which goes even a layer more subtle than this, which is, is there AP, are their APIs consistent? Have we done some dumb thing like one of them needs a fixed info string and the other one doesn't that's going to force the APIs to be different? Um, and so my... I'm pleasantly surprised this table is more aligned than I expected it was going to be when I started putting these slides together. So generally speaking, the LAMP stuff is a superset of the uh, OpenPGP stuff, which is a superset of the TLS stuff, which is a superset of the, um, the, C, the HPKE stuff. So it's mostly clean. Um, Russ made a comment he'd like this table to be smaller and fuller but how to get consensus on that is an open question. So one of the ones that's interesting here is the top line. LAMPS is the only group that's considering RSA-based hybrids. And we think that's correct. We think that LAMPS is, you know, CMS in particular, SMIME, um, I can, this is public information, I can say that Entrust does not have a public e elliptic curve-based SMIME route because we've never been asked for it. No one has ever tried to buy that from us. And to me, that's a strong indication that the SMIME ecosystem isn't ready to, to just say, you know, ECC is a thing we have, now let's bolt PQ onto it. And if, if the goal here is let's take the code base we have, the crypto we have that's battle hardened, that's timing side channel resistant, blah, 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 and let's use that as our bridge, then asking to implement ECC at the same time as PQ is not accomplishing that, that goal of using a trusted code base. So, yeah, there are some differences and LAMPS is, I think is a superset probably for good reason because X509 in general gets used very, very, very broadly, more broadly than I think anything else here. Um, there's also a question that I've been asked a couple times, why not the 521 size elliptic curves? Um, 
fair question. So we've taken the 384s as the highest strength lift to curve. I think that aligns with the CNSA document recommendations. So I, I think this is a defensible choice, but I'm aware that there are potentially alignment, safer suite alignment discussions that aren't fully resolved yet. Or that will come up later because Paul doesn't know how to speak into the mic. <laughs> okay, so let's go, I'll go through these one by one. Um, I don't know how much time I have if you want me to go through them quickly. Okay, let's go through these one by one. Um, so here's the, oh, here's an aside. Yeah, here's a quick aside. So let's talk about the NIST document SP856C Rev2, which tells you how to do a KDF, how to go from key material to a, to a symmetric key. And it's got this nice little sentence in it that says, this recommendation permits the use of a hybrid shared secret of the form Z prime equal to Z concatenated with T where Z gets you FIPS security bits and T gets you zero of them, but you're allowed to put anything that's not considered security relevant in there and that's okay. So this is great. This, this allows us to say, I've got a FIPS approved elliptic curve, which is my Z at full bit strength. And I've got some other thing that I'm not claiming FIPS security for, and we're gonna abuse that and it's great. <laughs> um, it allows you to do this with, with, a, with a hash, SHA-2, SHA-3. It allows you to do it with an HMAC of a, with a hash, and it allows you to do it with any of the KMAC sizes. The construction is a counter concatenated with your shared secret, concatenated with some fixed info string. The counter starts at zero. And if I think, I think it's only for the hash construction. You need to iterate and bump the counter each time. Um, so we have taken this exactly like exactly into the, the CFRG chem combiners draft so that if you implement the CFRG chem combiners directly, you are trivially compliant with this NIST spec. Your FIPS certification should be trivially and easy. In fact, we even fixed the counter at zero. Like we're not even incrementing it. We're just putting in this 32 byte zero. It's there, like don't, don't ask. A note on that, Mike, sorry. Um, still, please, talk with your lab when you're standardizing or doing authorization in FIPS, because there's widely a range of opinions about this statement. So don't take this for granted. <laughs> Just please talk with the FIPS authorization process. Yeah, of course, you'll, vendors will need to work with their labs. I'm not a lab, right? For some value with. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, the TLS hybrid design and the HPK cyber, um, I th it seems like they should be compliant, but with more explaining and hand waving and footnotes that have footnotes that have footnotes. Um, okay, so let's, yeah, let's actually get into the drafts. So the CFRG chem combiners, it aims to be an abstract KDF construction. It aims to be compatible with the NIST spec, the chem KDF. It aims to be suitable for combining two or more I think it's the only one that handles the case of or more, such that the overall combined chem will be in CCA2 so long as one of the component chems is. So we're not, we're not trying to add security properties to the chems, but as long as one of them is sufficiently strong, then we're trying to propagate that property to the other ones that are combined. This is the generic construction. You'll see it looks very similar to the previous slide, counter concatenated with some list of keys, concatenated with a fixed info. Uh, we have a little hack in here. We are rolling in the ciphertext, so we're committing ciphertexts. And we are, um, if the ciphertext, are, ciphertext and shared secrets are constant length, then you can do it the first way. If they are not constant length, I'm looking at you, RSA chem, then you, we want to have a right, right length encoding, right encoded length thing just so you can't do length extension -y type things. That was a trade-off we made recently. We originally had an extra layer of hashing in here and then we said actually we could do a length encoding instead of a hash and that gets us the same thing. Um, the instantiations provided are the KMAX and the SHA-3s, um, but this draft does not provide concrete instantiations of the component chems. So we're algorithm agnostic into which chems you're combining. And I know there's discussion should there be a SHA-2 instantiation and currently there is not. Hi, uh, Daniel Gilmore, can you, yeah, yeah. Um, does the fixed info contain an identifier for the particular combiner that's being used? I mean, are you committing to the algorithm that is in use here? Actually, DKG, 
remember, this working group is not supposed to be discussing how to do the protocols, and Mike is just showing what's there. Okay, I'll, I'll So I'll I would say, on. take, and I'm not saying, I'm, I'm using you as the first example. I suspect questions will appear on every slide of why, why did you or they do this and such. That's not for here. Question withdrawn. Yeah. <laughs> right. Good question, though. <laughs> if CR4G adopts this draft, we can discuss it there. OK, next. Uh, TLS hybrid design. This document focuses on ephemeral key exchanges in TLS 1.3. The construction is to just take the two things, smush them together, feed it into HKDF extract. Um, sometime later, the whole transcript gets fed into HKDF extract, including the ciphertexts, which is an important bit of footnote. Um, this also claims to be compatible with the NIST KDF. This is very close to being an instantiation of CFRG chem combiners. Uh, it includes the shared secrets and the CTs in cascading mode rather than in um, concatenated mode. Uh, it forgoes length encoding, and the argument there is because X20519, SEC P2, P256, and Kyber are all fixed length. Okay, this is a great example of how we intended the CFRG draft to be used. It's, a, it's like a checklist. It's an abstract sensation. It's a checklist. If you're going to deviate from it, then you just need to justify your deviations with a security argument. So this is, I think this is, this is great. Scott. Uh, just a quick uh, comment. Uh, the security of this construction depends very heavily on how the, the, the full TLS uh, key derivation function and will certainly not be secure in, in other contexts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The fact that this is an ephemeral key exchange is part of the security justification here, I think. Is that what, was that your Not that it is ephemeral, but instead of how the uh, key der derivation stirs in uh, the various things, it hashes the entire message. The transcript. Transcript, yeah. Yep. And the instantiations there are X20519, Kyber 768, draft 00, which is still the, fit, the, the round three, not the IPD, uh, and also a SEC P2 object. So there's only two instantiations here. Next. Next slide, please. OK. Draft Vesterbahn, uh, this is a CFRG HPKE adding a, a single X20519 Kyber 768, again, round three to HPKE. Um, yeah, so this one just does a straight concatenation. This one, I don't know if either Boss or Chris Wood is here. Boss is not. Chris was here this week, not in the room. OK. Um, so this, again, is a really nice example of how to use the CFRG draft. They say we, you know, they explicitly acknowledge it, and they say, here are the ways we are different. The security consideration section explicitly lays out the differences and explicitly justifies the differences. Maybe I'm going to violate Paul's rules. I don't think that analysis is correct. Can you <laughs> next slide, please? <laughs> <laughs> so this sentence in particular is the problematic one. So this statement was or is true. It is in fact a true statement. Kyber 768 draft 00, which is round three, does mix in the ciphertexts. That is no longer true of ML chem initial public draft. So if this is, is bumped up to do the current FIPS draft standard, this sentence is no longer true. Uh, the other thing that gets really confusing is HPKE 9180 in its DH chem in caps commits the ciphertext. This draft defines a different in caps that does not commit the ciphertext. So you don't get it for free from the HPKE layer and you don't get it for free from ML chem. This is the sort of down in the weeds knit stuff that's, that is different and really hard to align. Um, yeah, cool, I think that's all to say about this. Next. Just a note, going back to the previous presentation, I think this kind of thing, not the detail, but the bigger picture, is very important for the, uh, the engineer's draft, is to say, you might think you understand this, you might think you under understood really well at a particular time, things change, and therefore other things had to change. Rowan May, um, having implemented 
this with uh, in MLS with Kyber Draft Zero Zero, I could not agree more. And this was the point I've been making on the mailing list, on, on the on the, the Zulip chat over and over again. Um, if it's if it's safe, tell us because people are going to read things. They're going to go and like look look information up. They're going to read things. And if it if we say nothing here at ITF, then they're going to go and search for people to try to find an answer. So if we know the answer, tell tell the engineers the answer. Thanks. Okay, lamps, lamps composite chems. Uh, direct instantiation of the CFRG chem combiners. We chose either KMAC 128 or KMAC 256, depending on what things we're aligning with, the list, NIST level ones, smaller KMAC, yep. Um, given the wide range of applications of X509 encryption certs, we have set a very broad range of instantiations. Next slide. Uh, yep, there's a bunch of them. It's the, it's, it's the, uh, it's the set multiplication here of, of ML chem with RSA, ECDH SEC curves, ECDH Brainpool curves, and ECDH Edwards curves. I, if we can shorten this somehow, someone please tell me which ones you want out. <laughs> we'll figure out how to get consensus on that. Next. Draft Vustler Open PGP. So this is very tightly aligned to the LAMPS one. We've been the authors of these two, they have distinct authors groups. We've been working quite closely together. Um, so the instantiations here is a subset of the LAMPS one. It behaves really quite similar in all the ways, I believe. Next. And then there's this Jose draft, which um, again is just a direct instantiation of cr 4 gchem combiners with again, some subset of the algorithms. The I'm gonna put a footnote here that its authors probably don't want me to say, but I, I know there's some debate about whether Jose and Jose should, should get hybrids through HP, HPKE or whether this do this draft, which defines them directly against CFRG, CFRG chem combiners. I'm gonna to claim to not be an active participant of either of those working groups. I think you're presenting even later on this afternoon. So I expect that'll still come up at, at the Jose working group. But as far as alignment, I mean, it's you know fully aligned. Is that my last slide? I have a summary slide? Yeah, a summary slide. Cool. Um, okay. The CFRG chem combiners is intended to be an overkill construction. It's, it's intended to be safe no matter how dumb your component chems are. Again, I'm looking at URSA. <laughs> um, it, we're intending that, that, that protocols will instantiate it and either take it directly or simplify it with security consideration notes explaining why and how they've done so. And so all the ones that we presented so far, I think are really good examples of doing that. Um, the open question then becomes, if everyone is simplifying, could we simplify the top level construction? Um, for example, not, you know, if we decide we don't need to mix ciphertext or we decide, you know, are there some, could, if all this, everything that uses it simplifies, could we broker that up? And that's a discussion we could have. Um, yep, 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 yep. To my eyes, all the constructions are cryptographically equivalent. If not, if, but maybe to Russ's point, not API equivalent could be a distinction to look at. And I and to my eyes, there is a nice subset nesting, I think, except the Jose draft has one outlier. Otherwise, there's a nice subset nesting here. So these are all actually far closer aligned than I expected when I started doing these slides. Um, yeah, I think I've said this already. So there's some nice, nice examples of how to, of templates for how to instantiate the CFRG draft. Um, you know, he, they define the construction and then, then security consideration, they justify point by point the deviations. Ta-da. Great work. <laughs> Do we have anyone else in the queue? No. With that, thank you very much, Mike, again, for all the work. So now we come to um, all other business. Just to note, this is all other business about this working group. Um, <laughs> we've had issues in the past where people say, why isn't this post-quantum? Um, let's not do that again. Um, but anything else that people want to say or ask, we will, um, 
we have some new documents on you know that you've seen we want to wait on figuring out about bringing them into the working group i would love to see the working group a little bit more active on our two documents so we can sort of you know call them done whether we we push them towards the rfc editor or not that's a different question anyone else have any other business that they want to bring up related to either the presentation today or things in the post-quantum parts of the ITF that they're expecting to come up soon. Okay. Oh, wait. Ori. Hi, right. Ori Steele. So the question that Mike asked on the you know previous slide where you have um, this multiplication across RSA, ECDSA, the twisted curves, brain pool. Like, uh, I recognize that different working groups are maybe going to try and make uh, stress different points of that that table. Is is some authoritative? What what's our role in that discussion in those other working groups? That does seem like a discussion for us to have here, even though they're going to have their own version of it there anyway. Like I, I don't know how to ask the question I'm trying to ask. It comes to AD. Hi, Roman Tenilio, uh, responsible AD. I, I don't have a clean answer. Uh, we chartered this working group uh, not to make. We chartered this working group uh, not to make kind of standards, so that's out of scope. We chartered it to kind of have discussion for cross kind of cutting guidance, and we chartered it not to evaluate kind of security, uh, not not to evaluate the security properties of kind of specific algorithms. So if the question you're asking is, do we adjudicate cross working group design choices here? I, I think that's a little tricky. Uh, I am not saying that this can't be a last resort. I mean, I, first of all, by the way, appreciate the crosswalk that, that just got done. That's fabulous. It's kind of exactly the kinds of things kind of we should be talking about. Now, if we have concerns about the, the, the size and feel of that matrix, uh, I might suggest that we drop into the working groups to, to tee that up, to make that observation, because their first may not be situational awareness, kind of relative to that, I am not kind of clear. And I think we should see how those individual working groups react, and then we can think through how we have said, you know, said conversation. Because at that point, I mean, it's almost not even a post, uh, it's not a PQC issue, it's it's this observation, like there's a design pattern that's spanning kind of the second area, or perhaps it's even other areas, and like, let's make sure we do the right interoperable thing. So like, thank you for raising that. I mean, that's a great point. Let's take, let's organically continue to have the conversation. And that's me not committing but anything But to be clear, exposing in this working group a, a problem that you see that of things being too large or too small, perfectly reasonable to do. Exactly. We are non-committal, both of us. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Any other any other business that someone wants to propose? Oh, we have Ren. So. Hello, yes, Renzo Navas. Yes, just a quick comment. I, I discussed with Ori and with other guys in, in COSI. I mostly work with IoT, constrained, uh, sorry, constrained environment. So I'm just saying that I will start uh, trying to do a Kyber, a CAM in, in constrained uh, environments. I will start by taking the uh, work from Ori, who basically I just want to represent uh, uh, Kyber message over an IoT uh, network. First, I will start by doing the COSI representation or even CIVOR, non-authenticated, and then we will see how this will translate into a protocol, like maybe then, uh, ad hoc, I don't know. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in bringing post-quantum to IoT, so just this is the form, I guess, for to say thank you. Also, Deb? <laughs> I didn't put my badge on. I'm sorry. I'm Deb Cooley from NSA. Um, so we have a desire to get post-quantum algorithms fielded as quickly as possible. 
uh, because we think there's a real threat. Um, one of the ways that we see that happening faster is to use as much installed base as you already have, i.e. SHA-2. Um, so I encourage um, various working groups in the ITF to consider the fact that you have an installed base of SHA-2 that exists today. Um, SHA-3 is not deployed um, very many places. Um, <laughs> currently, the organizations that I support are fairly slow to upgrade, especially things like hardware. Um, so we, for example, find that hashes are very slow to migrate. Um, we shut down our last SHA-1 CA in November of 2022. If that gives you any idea about how slow slow is. Um, so if there's no loss of security and then no loss of speed in terms of like getting things approved, we would encourage the use of SHA-2. We feel that the security requirements when you did the development of both of these hashes are very, very similar. So there are some differences, obviously, but in the cases of the NIST drafts, it does not appear to be, they don't appear to come into play. Um, so that's my, that's my comment. I guess I'll take feedback. Okay. I have some replies. <laughs> Deb, is that a comment for IETF or for NIST? Because if you need SHA-3 internally to the MLs, uh, then you need it anyways. So, so the comment here is because of comments that have been made by my coworkers on the NIST list. Um, and there's um, possibly he's long and verbose. Possibly he's not clear in his statements, I don't know. But um, I'm here to clarify conversations that have possibly happened on the, on the NIST list. That same coworker of mine also made those same comments um, in the round four, I don't know what you want to call them, presentations, or whatever that was. Um, it's just from a speed point of view, they're comparable. From a requirements point of view, they're comparable. They are fully deployed. We will be able to guarantee by 2027 to 2030 that SHA-2 um, 3D4 is fully deployed in places. Um, we are finding some places that have not deployed that version of SHA-2, um, but we are pushing our current um, smart cards to that hash, which means you get 512 for free. 512 is what we want here, not, not 3D4. Phil's not in the list, is he? Oh yeah, yes, he, he is, is on the list. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I agree with most of what Deb just said, except we are starting to use uh, SHA-3 a lot as a KDF. And it has some really nice properties as a KDF because, you know, well, you don't need to layer things like you do to do HKDF. And so I think that uh, people should plan on doing both for the future. And what we need to ignore is the implicit uh, suggestion that two, three is better than two and see them as you know, two options that are equally good. And if you're trying to do a KDF, well, three is going to be better. If you try and do other things, two is going to be better. But they are otherwise interchangeable. So my point was, how quick is it to deploy? Yeah. And uh, I s stick by that original point. Any other things for AOB? We're not in a rush at all. Other than let's let's go back to Mike's, you know, presentation and pick through each of, of, of the concatenations versus it. Let's not do that. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Um, again, this we meet at meetings, but we get lots and lots of work done on the mailing list. Let's keep that up because we've got many months before the meeting. Um, in fact, it'll be summer by the time the next meeting happens. For those of you who haven't figured out in the Southern Hemisphere, it's summer in March. Um, so, uh, please 
keep, keep in on the drafts. We will discuss later um, whether to adopt new work. My preference is for us to get more, more done on the first stuff. We're not in a rush. And also, again, the mailing list is open for things like I'm seeing something happen between working group A and working group B, or I'm seeing something happen between CFRG and working group B, or I'm seeing things happening between these two other parts of the world that's not the IETF, but might be relevant to us. All of those things are perfectly appropriate on the mailing list. Yeah, so thank you for coming and take it to the mailing list. Thank you. <laughs>